The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining today. My name is Andrew Shikiar. I lead marketing here at FIDO Alliance. Um, we, we often start these webinars with a bit of a refresher on FIDO, uh, but we're going to largely forego that today um, so we can focus instead on, on the case study from TradeLink in Hong Kong. Um, however, I, I do want to give a bit of background and some updates in order to give added context uh, for today's talk. Um, in case you don't know, uh, FIDO was launched over five years ago with the goal of helping the industry re reduce reliance on passwords. This has been realized through open specifications for passwordless reauthentication via biometrics and also um, for a strong second factor to supplement passwords as realized through FIDO security keys. The specifications that enabled these experiences were UAF, so Universal Authentication Framework, and U2F, Universal Second Factor, uh, respectively. Both protocols adhere to a core FIDO concept, uh, which is that of authenticating users locally to their device, uh, storing authentication credentials locally as a private key and then keeping a public key on the server. Authentication is then completed through a, a cryptographic challenge response mechanism between the local authenticator and the server uh, with the relying party. This creates an unfishable authentication sequence for the user and also de-risks things for the RP uh, by eliminating the need to maintain a central repository of readable authentication credentials. So that's kind of the core to, to FIDO's approach. Um, more recently, you know, FIDO's built on this initial work in UAF and U2F uh, through the introduction of the FIDO2 specifications. Uh, which is comprised of the web authentication spec from W3C and the corresponding uh, client to authenticator protocol or CTAP from FIDO Alliance. Uh, WebAuthn reflects the contribution that FIDO made to W3C a few years back uh, with the goal of establishing a standard mechanism to authenticating users to websites and web services. WebAuthn and FIDO2 are now supported in leading web browsers as well as in the Windows and Android operating environments uh, this greatly expands a addressable, immediately addressable user base for FIDO authentication. So while there's a lot of excitement around FIDO2 and FIDO2 adoption starting to grow rapidly in the market, uh, UAF has always provided organizations with a mechanism to deploy FIDO authentication immediately, uh, and particularly in mobile first settings where authentication revolves around a native app. UAF, FIDO UAF uh, underpins many leading apps uh, from banks and other service providers uh, here in the Americas, that includes companies like PayPal, eBay, Bank of America, Intuit, and many more. Uh, but it's seen even stronger pickup in Asia Pacific um, with initial adoption from NTT Docomo in Japan, as well as many banks, other network operators, and other businesses in all corners of Asia. Um, FIDO's technical working groups uh, will continue to evolve UAF to meet current and emerging market requirements, while at the same time, working within W3C to bring these use cases uh, forward for further standardization. So today, you're going to hear a lot about um, how TradeLink has implemented UAF uh, to uh, you know, serve businesses and, and citizens in Hong Kong. So we're really pleased today to have Andrew Chang, who is the CTO of TradeLink, to walk you through their use case. So before we start, before I turn it over to the other Andrew, um, I just want to run through a few housekeeping items. First of all, um, yes, this webinar will be recorded and the slides and replay will be shared with you afterwards. So we'll send you an email probably in the next 24 to 48 hours with the link. Um, so, so be patient, it will come to you. Uh, secondly, um, feel free to ask short questions or any questions through the GoToWebinar client. So there should be a little question box um, on your screen somewhere. You can type a question in there. Um, we will answer them midstream, you know, during the webinar if possible. Otherwise, if they're applicable to the whole group, we'll take them in an open Q&A at the end. Um, any questions that we don't answer, you know, we'll, we'll aim to address via follow-up uh, email. Um, so again, the way that will work, you'll type in a question, I'll moderate it, I'll either answer the question myself or pass it to Andrew Chang for him to answer. Uh, last but not least, um, you'll see a survey at the end of the webinar. Um, if you could take a few moments to fill this out, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, your feedback uh, helps inform our webinar program. Uh, for example, this is the first time we've held a, a webinar targeted specifically uh, at the Asia Pacific time zones. Uh, this is based on feedback we had from other people in the past asking for you know, this, type of, this type of webinar. So please do fill that out when you're done. So 
with that, uh, I'm now very pleased to introduce you to Andrew Chang, CTO of TradeLink. Andrew, let me make you presenter. Thank you. All right, go to spare with me in this set. Okay, morning. Well, uh, from Hong Kong time, morning to everybody. Um, thank you, Andrew, for the introductions. So um, I'm going to share with you um, the UAF development in Hong Kong, as mentioned by Andrew. Andrew, uh, you need to hit present, I believe. Either on the client. Is it okay now? Uh, I need to do something that says show my screen, perhaps. There we go. Sorry, say that again. So go into presenter mode or go into the uh, full mode, and you'll be in good shape. So right now we see your your uh, speaker notes. Yeah, okay. You see a speaker note, not a full piece of not, not the full screen quite yet. So if you go to display settings, that, that should cover it, I think. Um, where is it? Top I think display settings. If you go to the top, uh, top center of your. Yeah. Try that one. Is it okay now? No, uh, that's worse. Oh yeah, there it is. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay. All right. Oh, sorry about that. All right. So let's start again. Um, so in the next half an hour, so I'll share with you some of the work we've done in Hong Kong on five dollar applications. As mentioned by Andrew, our focus is very much on the UAF. And for that, I assume that, um, so some of those that are attending that have a basic understanding about the UAF, um, I will well, fire the question up and then we'll try to answer that later on as we go through. In terms of the agenda, I want to talk about the following. Um, to start with, I want to talk about the two AF adoptions in Hong Kong. Again, I'm, I'm sure that everybody is familiar with the term two AF, two FA. Now, um, 2FA means a lot of things, anything to do with 2 fat and to authenticate users. And this is how we see, under the requirement of Hong Kong of 2FA, how the FIDO UFA can actually fit into the pictures. And with that in mind, we will talk about the adoptions of FIDO 2AF in Hong Kong. Now, uh, we have a history of that not that long ago, as last time I met Andrew, we started the endeavor some two years ago in 2016, October to be exact. And I would like to share from then to now where we are on the final year versions. Now, during the endeavor, we learn a lot of things. Um, honestly, we also hear lots of wars here and there. So I want to share some of the lessons that we learned during the course of the endeavor. Uh, last but not least, I will also talk about uh, the next steps where we are now and we are going heading in the coming few years. Okay, start with the 2FA in Hong Kong. Um, as you can see in the slides, Hong Kong is very serious and cautious about my cyber securities. Um, more and more activities nowadays, uh, whether it is linked to a dollar sign or any sensitive documents, are now carry out through the internet. And I think we had that vision many years ago. Um, back in the 2000s, the Hong Kong government actually has set up the electronic transaction ordinance the law to give digital signature the same legal legal status as a hand within signatures. Um, for that, uh, we, we didn't mandate it, but we talk about the use of digital certificates involving the use of private key and public keys uh, under the PKI framework. Um, regulators in Hong Kong also are governing uh, online transactions, make sure that things are doing in a proper and correct manner. And we have a lot of guidelines from the regulators, particularly on the financial industries. Um, um, for any high risk transactions, for example, transfer money to an unknown bank account, or even nowadays, if you are going to buy stocks or the like, they will be classified as high risk transactions. And as such, um, the use of 2FA is mandated. Now, this is the bank backbone, or this is type of the framework that we are working in. Um, in the case of Hong Kong, we try to be neutral in technology. We didn't really mandate a particular technology, but um, we still have some guidelines from the regulators. <coughs> to start with, 
we want to look at things that are based on standards. Um, we're not saying proprietary and not good, but if you have a standard, you will go with, you always got a point of references and you know where to go when things goes wrong here or there. As such, um, the popular choice or the choice that was available over the past three years, including the use of OTP on SMS basis, I put an asterisk there because this is kind of the thing in the past and uh, was facing out that um, I think this is the worldwide phenomenon. OT by hard token is also a very popular choice for the past decade or so. However, in view of the popularity of the mobile devices, as well as the fact that people are carrying more and more OTP tokens with them, um, either in terms of the user convenience as well as the cost, this is also um, kind of going to the end of the life. So we see a decline on the demand on that. Digital certificate, as I mentioned, it will have been founded by the law in Hong Kong. Um, it was a good idea, but in the past, um, we hit a lot of issues when we try to de deploy digital certificates. I think usability is definitely an issue that we have to address. And honestly, um, technology was not quite there to support that in a massive scale. And I think in the recent years, in the past two years or so, uh, we see the rise of soft token as well as the biometric as a means to um, come into the rescue for the 2FA. Set aside the requirement from the regulators on the financial sectors or the like, we also need to, and uh, we are really treasures about privacy in Hong Kong. So we, under the um, um, Office of the Privacy Commissioners for Personal Data, we have a personal data ordinance, and for which I would like to highlight some of the key points. Um, use of biometric is allowed. You can use biometric, but you will need to justify why you're using it. And you should do it on a necessary and not excessive basis. So if possible, you should not collect too much of the end user information. And really you need to do it um, to just uh, with a means to justify why you're doing it. And on the other hand, um, according to the ordinance, um, when you're trying to do biometric matching or the like, there's a patching or there's a preferences on the match on devices, i.e. the user credential, whether this is a fingerprint, face, voice, iris or the like, should be stored or processed in the end user devices, rather than being, uh, you know, pulled back and handle it in the central database. The reason for doing that is to avoid the risk of, you know, a central database being hacked. And once you go into that scale of hacking, the consequence can be catastrophic. And of course, um, because you are handling the biometric data, uh, unlike the password or the ODP, um, one-time password or the like, this is actually owned by the user, not by the service provider as such. So service provider providing that kind of services will probably also need to provide or conduct what we call a privacy impact assessment. Um, we, we see that the on device um, authentication is on the rise for a very good reasons in Hong Kong. Um, some fun facts, um, in terms of the populations in Hong Kong, uh, according to statistics, I mean, this year we have about 7.5 million people living in Hong Kong. However, if you look at the same framework or time frame, the number of subscribers of mobile devices or mobile services is 18.4 million. That means every people in Hong Kong will have at least one to two or even more mobile devices hand. That gives you an idea about the penetrations. Uh, you know, mobile device is very much part of our life. And on that basis, if you look at all those mobile devices, they support various um, biometric authentications natively, whether this is face ID, touch ID, iris, facial recognitions, or the like. So this serves the purposes in the 2FA framework um, as the one of the factors that who you are. Now, when you talk about 2FA, you need two factors. So now, leveraging the mobile device capability, we have the first or one of the um, Better for authentication. So, what is the second one? Of course, um, people will talk about, hey, let's do a device finding. Um, you know, your mobile device, you own the mobile device, you're you're having it in your hands. 
that should be a good enough second factor. And this is what, what we call the what you have. Um, however, according to Hong Kong Monetary Authority and quote unquote, the mere registrations of the customer devices may not be stringent enough to be regarded as, as something as a customer has for 2FA purposes. So simply I think the device ID, IMEI, or even the mobile number, that is not good enough as a second factor. So in that cases, if you're looking at um, some of the service world are asking, hey, why don't I just simply make use of whatever biometric authentications available on the phone and uh, I run my own apps and is it good enough as a 2FA? Um, sadly, the answer is no. That at best is regarding as a 1FA and that can only be used for low risk transactions such as um, just a general login to your account or inquiry of your account information. Now, to look at the perspective of the penetrations of biometric in these regions, as I say, it's really well received it in APAP. And just another fun fact, um, as some of you may be aware, a few days ago, actually last Sunday is what we call the double eleven, the um, the eleven of November. Um, you know, this getting into an international event, the single single day exercise in um, in in the internet. So people are buying like crazy. Just to give you some fun some numbers that I managed to collect on that twenty four hour period. The total sales is something between or at around 30.65 billion US dollars. And the fun thing is, and I think this is encouraging, is that 60.3% of such payments are actually authenticated by mobile biometrics, uh, whether it is fingerprint or facial recognition. So in a lot of sense, um, the market is ready, the end user is quite ready. They really embrace the use of biometric as a means to authenticate their identity. And this has now become the domino um, preferences from the end user perspective. And while we talk about 2FA, of course, there's other solutions available in the market. Um, and the reason for us or most of the people in Hong Kong are preferring the biometric or the UAF, which I'm going to cover a little bit later, is the fact that other solutions when you're using it on mobile devices, such as um, software, OTP, or the like, they can be vulnerable. As you can see on this particular slide, um, we are having two devices there, uh, not only which one is which, but um, by just looking at that, you can tell um, the device has been coded. And so the coded devices managed to generate the same OTP as the original devices that's actually is a breach of security. So we need something a little bit better than this to safeguard our transactions, especially when you look at the um, transaction model that can be involved in a typical transactions. I think this is where FIDO UAF come into the rescue. Now we see FIDO UAF after a very thorough studies, it is almost a perfect fit to meet the 2FA requirements in Hong Kong. Uh, first of all, as mentioned and Andrew also stated, user authentication is actually done in your devices, the end user devices, it's not by any central server or the like. Um, as such, it preserves the privacy requirement as stated. And the other thing is, once you do the authentications, we also leverage the hardware capability of the devices to generate a, what we call the UAF key pairs, um, a private and a public key for that particular applications on that particular devices. And again, this is based on the public key cryptography, which is standard base. Um, we see the solution is the same in a lot of sense as what we are trying to achieve with a digital certificate, it's all based on the PKI. And as I stated, as part of the requirement from the, or the guideline from the Hong Kong regulators, we see that by the use of the private key and public key on devices, it can serve as a strong device binding and hence achieve, truly achieve the requirement of what, the, what you have as a result. Now, talking about the key protections, um, we, we can be a bit more specific on that. With references, again, to um, from the Hong Kong MA, when you talk about digital certificate securities, i.e. the public key and the public key, it's stated if a digital certificate is adopted for 2FA, AI 
um, all fire licenses should under the MA, of course, should ensure that the certificate and its associated public key is non duplicable and stored in a secure manner, manner, not media, sorry. And I think that gives you an idea that the key protections of the private key is on the critical path. So this is this is essential, this is a must. So if you want to use key pair as a means to do authentications and achieve what we call one of the um, authentication factors, the handling of the private key is crucial. We need to be really careful on that. And as I can repeat on that, it needs to be non duplicable uh, It cannot be stored in the software. It didn't say specifically how you store it, but as I is out, that key should not be exported or can be copied elsewhere. Um, that's the way to achieve the level of security needed by the regulator. Now, in terms of the adoptions of UAF in Hong Kong, as I mentioned, we started the journey back in 2016, um, around the October timeframe. We actually have the first case, first UAF adoption in Hong Kong by a bank. Um, they are actually using adopting the FIDO UAF as a means to replace the SMS OTP for mobile stock trading. And since then to now, after two years or so, um, the population growth quite significantly. We now have six banks in Hong Kong that have adopted the FIDO UAA framework. Um, five, also we have five stockbrokers, one insurance company, and even the regulator themselves are using it. Now up to that point, most of these transactions are financial related, whether it's linked to your bank account, your insurance, or when you're buying stock. So it's all money related. Um, happy to say that the adoption of FIDOs go beyond the financial sectors. Um, we have recently um, deploying a cases with one of the major community benefactors. Um, they're also using the same technology on doing that. And basically, we see the need of FIDO is now a norm in Hong Kong. As a result, um, for the two years of hard work, um, among ourselves as well as one of our partner, Dayon, uh, we now have something like in excess of 2.5 million users account. And that is FIDO UAF enabled as of today. And the other good thing about UAF, and I think the part, um, uh, other part facts as well, is um, when you understand the UA framework, really um, from the service provider point of view, from the end user, uh, from the central server point of view, the only information the end user is sharing with you is the public key, not the password, not the facial, uh, facial information, not your fingerprint on the light. So the only information is the public key uh, from your devices. That is the only thing shared between um, yourself and your service provider. That's one thing. Secondly, um, implement a FIDO solutions. Well, it's not difficult, but yeah, it's not something that you can just pick up and buy and go. You still need to understand our framework and so. So we actually see the need on the potentials of offering the FIDO UAF as a services, as an outsourcing services, as you can say that. So we're now offering what we call authentication as a services. So for some of the service provider, they can now focus purely on their business, day-to-day -day business, and they can leave all the authentications to a trusted third party. And for that trusted part, third party, the only information is going to handle is the end user public key, but nothing else. I don't even need to know the user account. I don't need, know, to, need to know anything that is personal to the end users. And I think the diagram is self-explanatory. So basically we take the burden away from the users and we leave HF FIDO framework, um, all the characteristics. We are now offering service in such mode to some of the community in Hong Kong as well. Um, so that basically situations in Hong Kong. So we see a very good pickup on that. And we're hoping to you know, double, triple, even quadruple uh, in the coming, coming years. Like I say, during the last two years, um, we, we learn as, as a way full. So there's a lot of things we learned, um, half bad, things we don't like, or the like, we learned quite a bit here and there. So I want to share with, with the audience some of the lessons that we have learned. To, um, namely, that's including handset support. Um, people talk about offline transactions, scalability, and people also asking, hey, 
Fido is such a good framework, can you do more for us? First of all, I'll talk about handset support. Now, um, for those who are familiar with the Fido framework, like I say, one of the key thing uh, is the capability of the mobile devices that can security generate they handle and process the private key of the end users. And for that, you need to leverage what we call the FIDO authenticator as shown in the diagram. Um, what to, to, to handle the FIDO key properly, um, there are different options. It's one of them is what we call the TEE, trusted execution environment available in, in the mobile devices. Um, that basically, for those who are interested in that, can you can take out more from the engineer. But the in principle is kind of a second OS, running security on your mobile devices that is invulnerable from hacking, which is is self-contained, that is shielded from the outside world. So if we can put the key into a what we call TE FIDO authenticators available on the handset, then we are all good. All right. Unfortunately, um, as of today, not all the handsets available in the market or not all handsets that you're using have native TE FIDO authenticator in it. In fact, it is still very limited. And we also learned from the hard truth that even some of the phones or some of the manufacturers, they put in the TE FIDO authenticator into their mobile devices, they have bought the access to the general public or to the service providers. So you may be able to see there's an authenticator in there, but you are not, are not able to use it. Also, again, learning from, from experience is not all the TE-based file authenticators behave in the same manners. Um, take example, uh, we in Hong Kong, so language support, uh, we need to support both Chinese as well as English. And um, one fun thing is when, when we try to deploy a solution for a particular band, uh, it works all well, but when we switch language to Chinese, the display was unable to display anything uh, for the FIDO part of that. So this is here and there. Again, for those who are familiar with the FIDO um, UAF framework, um, there's also another key component called FIDO metadata services. Again, um, I think this is still work in progress, so um, it cannot fully provide the services needed on, on the scenario. So we see that if we stuck with the, what we call the TEE approach, that will really limit the adoption of FIDO as a result. Now, the next slide, I'm not expecting anybody to read it, but just to give you a fun fact again, um, this is actually a snapshot of the um, authentication services that Trailing is offering. Um, by leafaging not the TE authenticator, but we are actually using um, the the authenticator from from a third party, uh, namely day on the the one from day on. Um, this is the result. This is actually the list, uh, a partial list of mobile devices um, that our customer are using. And if you want to count it, um, save it because this is not the first. This is not a full blown list, but I can tell you that we have now more than one thousand different type of brand or model of mobile devices. This is something that. I think this is this is actually giving everybody a, a realistic view of you know the market out there. People are really using different sorts of devices, particularly on the Android cam. And even in the case of Hong Kong, we are seeing a lot of phone. There are sorts of parallel import into Hong Kong things like Docomo. And even for some of them, I don't even know where they're from. But this is the situation. So really, if you want to deploy a solution that can Trade or that can serve most of your customers. Handset support is really a key issue. Now, like I say, um, we tried the TE approach. At best, we can properly support about 10, 20 devices available in the market. Um, but compared with the requirement out there, it's not quite enough. So we need to have a work around. As I mentioned, by working with our partner, uh, we leverage what we call a software based authenticators. Uh, I'm sure that for the audience here will say, hey, where is that? Software, you're talking about security, non duplicate Can software really do that? By itself, it is a challenge. However, um, I think we are lucky with the advance of the mobile device in the market. There's actually an piece of weapon that we can make use of, namely what we call the secure on-grave on the iOS devices, 
or the hardware back the key stores available on most of the Android device nowadays. So by leafaging that we can put the FIDO keys into the hardware secure module or the like the equipments on your mobile devices. That will achieve the requirements for the protections of the private key. Also, um, in the hard fact is phone has been ruled JB or had here and there. So we need to do things what we call um, device health chat. So, um, so we will make sure that, for example, when we install um, the FIDO Authenticator on your devices or during the lifetime of that uh, FIDO Authenticator being installed into devices, the device is not rooted or it is not um, JPEG good. And of course, we all can also make references to um, Google CTS as a mean to see um, as, a, as a references of the healthiness of the end user device as well. And also by leafaging some kind of, this kind of technologies, we can eliminate the device with modify or an official ROM being used. It. Root detection is another thing we use. And getting very popular is within the applications, we also need to kind of harden it, um, not on the OS level, but actually on the apps level. And this is what, what we call the RASP, real-time app server self-protection came in um, place to help to provide a solution that can address all the security concerns before we offer a secure solution to the market. So that's on the handset support. Other thing is what we call the offline transactions. Um, as most of the audience can probably tell, FIDO stands for Fast Identity Online. Um, that means you're doing things when you're connected to the internet or the like. Uh, I think nine out of 10, that's the case. However, there are cases, um, transactions not really online in reality. Um, take the extreme cases, when people are traveling OCC, they have data room, they may have their data rooming turned off because of the cost issues or the like, or, or whatever, some external um, environment issues. So, um, well, they have their mobile phones in hand, but there's no internet connection with it, one way or the others. So in these cases, you cannot do any authentications under the FIDO framework. And basically, this is where the traditional software OTP has the advantage over such approach, because for the OTP, an OTP on your devices can be generated whether this is connected or um, uh, not connected or offline. So even though this approach, when you're talking about TB, as I showed that on the previous slides, is kind of weaker in terms of security compared with FIDO, um, mainly due to there's no proper way to protect the OTP seat on a software base in your mobile devices. However, um, this is still the case that people are still using soft token um, because of their capability of doing offline transactions. So um, without an answer, well, not directly, we ask, can FIDO UF be enhanced or can it be included to address the offline transaction requirement from the industry? Next, I want to talk about scalability. Again, um, for those who are familiar with FIDO, uh, I think we talk about the key string of FIDO. Um, usability is good. Uh, so you, you leave your mobile devices, yet at the same time you preserve um, the security fashion or the security um, part of the, of the framework. So this is a key string of that. And it comes with a cost, honestly. <laughs> and as a file though, you first, you leave your device computation power and connectivity. Uh, we talk about using the public key cryptography. All this put together has been a very secure framework for us to conduct secure transactions. But as I mentioned, it comes with a cost. The fact that when you're using a FIDO UAF transactions, if you look at the message protocol, the bandwidth requirements, as well as the bandwidth, uh, the band computations, um, the database storage, or the, it all add up. So um, in some of the practical cases, um, just for references, we come to a cases that, for example, um, a user base of um, about a million users, and the requirement is that um, on a on a peak 
processing uh, period, they need to address something like 2,000 concurrent SS per second. Every one of them are doing a FIDO authentication at the same time. So you put a lot of um, constraint and put a lot of computation requirements to the backend server. And that is something we need to address as well. So while it is good, which is secure, it actually come with a cost. So for those who are thinking about deploying that, you need to be aware um, this is actually a cost associated. Of course, um, on the other hand, um, I think this is something for FIDO UAF, probably for the work group to further look into that and see uh, while we serve preserving the um, security, can we do a bit better in terms of the scalability? So as as a result from that, we are asking can can all um, end users is also asking whether FIDO can also be enhanced. At this moment of time, when we talk about the user authentications, basically it's one way because we're just handling the private key and public key from the end users. Um, a lot of our customers are asking, hey, can we do a two-way authentications? I.e., can we also, for the end user devices, to authenticate the server or the service providers? So we do a two-way handshake. Um, while we are, since we are using private and public key, customer also asking, can you do more than signatures? Can you also handle like, things like end-to-end -end data encryptions from the end user devices to the server and vice versa? Also, as key has been used, can you actually use it not only for the final message signing? Can the keys on the device be used to sign document electronically? So this is something I think I don't need to further investigate and see whether this is feasible and to be incorporated. So this is what we learned so far. And like I say, and this is the last session I want to handle as a web up is to give you a glimpse into the futures. Um, not that I have a crystal ball, but like I say, things are moving very quickly in this part of the world, particularly in case of Hong Kong. So I'd like to share with the audience one of the things that is happening right now. Um, the Hong Kong government is now in the process of um, issuing or going to issue what we call a Hong Kong electronic identity, EID in short. Briefly, this is a government initiative from the Hong Kong government. Um, the idea is to issue an electronic ID to all citizens in Hong Kong for free lifetime. All right. In contrast, um, at this moment of time, currently, we all, all the citizens in Hong Kong are carrying a physical smart card. So this is our kind of second identity uh, to be used on the web or on the electronic world. Um, government has designed that this solution is going to be a cloud basis, which is going to be operated by government. I.e. your EID, um, at least logically, will be stored centrally or handled centrally by the government. For an end user to access the EID for whatever transaction they need to carry with the EID, um, the end user needs to authenticate themselves to the central, to the central government server in order to access the EID. And the government has designed the means to do it is to full, um, to do it through the end user registered mobile devices. Um, and the government has stated in the requirement, um, the, the technology that needs to be adopted will be the FIDO UAF adoptations uh, for, the, for the end user device registrations, as well as the subsequent authentications. As well as I mentioned earlier, um, we also will be using digital certificates um, bounded by the ETO. The service will be used uh, for both online and offline. Um, government plans to launch the services by mid 2020, um, with a view that you can be used that such EID can be used for both the government as well as all the commercial services available in Hong Kong for all the citizens here. Just pictorially, just to give you an idea, um, the framework, this is based on our um, understanding about the EID framework. So basically, um, it's the central services, as I mentioned, offered by the government. So people will actually register the EID through their mobile devices so they can apply for EID. Um, behind the scene, what you really do is 
a digital certificate will be generated for that particular users. However, before the generation of such digital certificates, um, the Hong Kong EID will also cost chat some of the submitted information, for example, um, information available or um, associated with your Hong Kong ID card, they will cost chat it with the Hong Kong Immigration Department, which is the department that is currently issuing the uh, smart ID to all the citizens in Hong Kong. So they kind of have a golden source to cost chat, make sure the information submitted or presented is actually um, true and is accurate. Once they done that, um, certificate will be issued as stated. At the same time, um, a device binding will also be take place. And for that, that will again make use of the FIDO UF framework. So um, once um, a YAD is ready to be issued, an end user will be prompt um, to register their mobile or their, um, their biometric characteristics, whether it's finger pin, um, even password, or their face ID or the like um, on a particular mobile devices. And from that moment, um, that devices will be bonded um, asso and associated with your EID. And of course, in order to use the devices, um, that will leverage the onboard biometric authentications, hence the FIDO UAF framework. Um, once this is in place, um, different service provider, whether it's government or commercial services, Again, they are going to use the um, authentication as a services framework, as I mentioned earlier, <coughs> as a means to authenticate users. <coughs> so whenever you are accessing a government or commercial services, um, all you need to do, or the service provider to do, is to query the EID services. And Hong Kong EID service will then approach the customers, whether full push notification, QR code, or the like, to obtain the consensus or, from the end users that he or she is indeed um, is authorized such transactions, whether it's a lock-in, um, money transfer, or even signing a digital document. So on that, that will conclude my presentations. Um, I hope this is useful to you guys. And uh, I think this is time to pass it back to Andrew. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Andrew. Um, very interesting and, and you know, similar to what uh, you presented in, in Singapore as well. Uh, so for those of you on the call, we, we had a seminar in Singapore and, and Andrew presented the, the trade link case study. Uh, amongst all the presenters, uh, he's actually received, I think, the highest highest feedback uh, from audience as far as uh, level of interest and engagement. So uh, let's turn now to, uh, to Q&A. Um, if you have any questions, please ask them in the GoToWebinar client. Um, now is a good time to ask them. I have one here for Andrew. Uh, I think it's in regards to the uh, Hong Kong Citizen Identity Project. Uh, who is going to implement the EID? Do you know, Andrew? Sorry, say it again. Uh, who is going to implement the EID, electronic Not ID? Yet. Um, this is now in the middle of the tendering process. Um, but the government, um, particular what we call the Office of government CIO, they are in charge of the entire project. So they are the one that is going to design, build, and operate the EID services. So it's going to be done by the government. Uh, of course, they will go to ask help from the outside world, getting vendor to put in the solutions. But in terms of the standard, or the technical specifications or the like, you mentioned the use of the FIDO framework, uh, PKI, and all the other related technologies. Okay. Uh, related question here. Uh, can citizens use multiple mobile devices, tablets, and other devices to control um, their EID, or does it assume just one one mobile at a time? Okay. Um, I think this is a generic question, not only applicable to EID. Basically, this is a generic sure. final question. Um, we, we see different requirements from different people, honestly. Um, now, the EID, my understanding, according to the information of the public, um, that will allow users to use multiple devices. So basically, if you, you let's say, you use um, iPhone on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, then you just register a particular iPhone. And let's say for the rest of the week, you prefer to use an Android phone for whatever reasons, then you use that. I think that's one beautiful thing about that, about the FIDO approach. Is we are not linked to your mobile device number. 
will not link to your mobile number. Uh, we are main, actually linked to your device that you have in hand. So even if you change your mobile number, that won't affect that. So um, all you need to do is if you know you're going to use multiple devices, you can register. It. And of course, the system at the bank need to address that. And i.e., they will know to know um, through the registrations, um, you are actually associated with multiple devices. Now that said, allow me to clarify one more point. Uh, while you are using multiple devices, doesn't mean that you have multiple EID. You still have the same EID, just that associate or can be accessed by multiple registered devices. Um, I want to also um, make another point on that, based on our past two years experience when you deploy solution like that. Um, from an end user point, of course, we welcome um, the support of multiple devices. But this is always a question from the service provider point of view in terms of the um, what if the customer lose their devices and when they have multiple devices, normally they will just call you and say, help, I lost my devices, can you help me to deactivate that? That's easy to see. But what if I actually have two iPhone registered and you know, customer lost their device, they're in the panic mode and <laughs> you cannot really tell which phone they lost. So, this is something um, as a service provider, we need to think about how to address that. So we see different approach in the market. Some of our customers restrict the use to a single devices. Some allow them up to five devices. And you just need to know, you know, both pros and cons associated with such. Interesting. Andrew, another question for you. Um, is it possible in Hong Kong to make use of remote qualified signatures uh, similar to EIDAS in the EU, uh, where UAF is Can used... You, sorry, you're picking up, sorry, say that again. Oh, I'm sorry. Is it possible in Hong Kong to make use of remote qualified signatures where UAF is used for authentication? Sorry, Andrew, you're picking up again. I cannot hear, sorry. Hmm. Is it possible in Hong Kong to make use of remote qualified signatures where UAF is used for authentication? Um, actually, I think this is this is a topic I think FIDO is now studying right now. Yeah. What we're trying to do, and you should see the framework, um, basically they are trying to com combine the, the best of breed from the FIDO framework, as well as the digital framework, a uh, digital certificate framework we have in Hong Kong. So um, the FIDO keys are purely used on the device finding part of that for authentication or the like at this moment of time. Uh, in terms of digital signatures, they still go back to the digital certificate to be issued uh, based on the EID and which it needs to be done by a recognized certificate of authority in Hong Kong. So this is kind of a two-prong process. Um, the use of the FIDO key is, at this moment of time, is kind of concentrated on the use of authentications to the bank systems. And for digital signature to sign a a legally binded document, we rely on the traditional digital certificate approach. Now, uh, whether this is the same or how it can be applied elsewhere in the world, uh, I think we need to look at it on a case by case basis. Okay. Well, so, you know, as Andrew just referenced, I mean, those are, there are use cases. And as I mentioned at the beginning, that FIDO continues to work on across the specifications. Uh, we also have uh, deployment working groups, which you know, collaborate to look at you know, best practices for a variety of deployment scenarios, whether that's to consumers, uh, to citizens and government type scenarios, and also inside the enterprise. So that, that's uh, where these types of discussions happen uh, frequently inside the Alliance. So that brings us to the end of our questions um, and towards the end of our seminar. Um, so if you would, you know, first of all, thank you all very much for attending today. Uh, again, the, the recording and slides will be sent to you over the next couple of days, and they'll be posted on our website uh, where you registered for the seminar. Uh, if you could, before you sign off, or when you do sign off, please take a moment uh, to take the survey at the conclusion of the webinar. So with that, I'd like to thank Andrew Cheng very much for his time today, and thank you all for your time and for your questions. We'll look forward to seeing you on a future FIDO webinar. Thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Bye.